How's it going, everyone? My name is Daniel Orion, and welcome to the third episode in our Beginner's Guide to Spider Identification. Today's episode is all about one of my favorite groups of spiders, the cobweb spiders. These guys are also referred to as tangleweb spiders or comb-footed spiders. And just like with the orb weaver spiders, the coolest thing about them is with their webs. If you remember from the previous episode, if you're looking at a web that's flat two-dimensional and is full of circles and lines like this, it's an orb web that belongs to an orb weaver spider. Well, cobweb spiders are also famous for their webs, but they do not look like this. This is one of the best pictures I've found to accurately describe what a cobweb kind of looks like because it shows off how messy it is. There is, unlike the orb web, very little structure that we can kind of identify when looking at this. It just kind of looks like silk was put everywhere just to uh, fill in space. It's also not really two-dimensional, it's three-dimensional, right? Because if you imagine something flying through the web of an orb weaver spider, if it gets through the strands that are trapping it, it's home free. There's no silk in front of it anymore. But here, with the cobwebs, there's kind of silk everywhere. So even if you detach yourself from one line and keep walking, you're just going to run into another one. The cobweb spiders really like to put these cobwebs in places where there are multiple attachment points for the strands of silk. For example, uh, you will often find cobweb spiders in your house, but uh, just a flat wall on the end is not their favorite place to put a web because it needs to support a, a three-dimensional structure where the strands of silk are attached to multiple points, right? So one of the places that they love to set up in my house is where two walls meet and on the ground so that you can both attach to the floor and to each of the walls. And that makes it easier for them to attach their webs to. Out in nature, they really like piles of wood and they really like the insides of some logs. Now, unlike orb weavers, who I described as specialists that were meant to catch flying prey, cobweb spiders are more like generalists that are really making webs to sort of catch anything. Of course, what they usually end up catching are small insects or things that are walking along the ground that end up getting tangled up in these cobwebs, right? But also, if the cobweb is high enough, like the one in this picture, it could easily just catch a moth that was flying a little bit too close to it, right? The cobweb spider, it makes very little difference to them. And finally, the cobweb spider, when it's still inhabiting its web, it will usually be found hanging somewhere inside it, upside in an upside-down position, much like our spider is in this image. So as I described, usually what these cobwebs end up catching is prey that is sticking close to the ground and ends up running into the silk and getting tangled up with it. And sometimes the silk will detach and actually start sending the whatever crashed into it upward where the spider will sense it, come down, and actually start pulling it up, like you see in this left image. And once it's up high enough, the spider will begin wrapping it up, using its back legs to connect to its spinnerets, pulling out the silk and wrapping it around whatever is struggling to get out. And finally, the spider will de deliver its venomous bite, and the prey will be subdued and ready to be consumed. So here's a quick guide. Cobweb spiders ideally want to be in their webs, especially as adult females, where they're most easily easy to identify. However, this might not always be the case. Maybe they got evicted for some reason. Maybe their home got destroyed because some log got moved or someone cleaned out their basement or garage or, you know, many, many, a couple of different reasons why a cobweb spider would be wandering. And here's how you would identify them with or without their webs. Their exoskeletons are usually very glossy. So it's not like you're looking at a solid color. It's like the, it, the light almost reflects off of it, right? Hairs are barely visible on these types of spiders. Uh, they are very slow moving when they're not in their webs. I guess I shouldn't say very, but compared to other spiders, they're not very graceful at walking. You see them almost trip a, a lot. Uh, and part of the reason why is because their legs aren't really designed for walking. They're, they're designed to hang off of their messy cobwebs and also to spin silk really quickly when it comes to wrapping prey. That's why the two longest legs that they have are their front two and then their back two. Uh, that's going to be most common with cobweb spiders. Their legs are going to be decently long and decently skinny, though not as exaggerated as some other spiders. Uh, their cephalothorax, where their eyes are found and where their legs come out of, that's going to be really small, but their back section, the abdomen, is usually going to be very thick. So a lot of these things they have in common with the orb weaver spiders, which is why I didn't lead with this stuff, because outside of the 
maybe the no visible hairs thing because a lot of orb weavers have hairs on their legs a lot of these body plans are very similar so it really is going to be the type of web that these spiders are in that is going to be key for a beginner to successfully identify them and before we move on i do want to point out that some of the male counterparts of these spiders have some exception to some of these traits and the most common exception is that the cephalothorax and abdomen are more commonly going to be about the same size. So as you can see in these two species of cobweb spiders, these are both males, and both of their body parts kind of look like the same size, right? You don't have that really big, really round back part and the really small front part. So uh, just something to be aware of. There are exceptions to some of the things that I say. So we're going to move on to really bringing up what kind of spiders classify as cobweb spiders. And I'm going to address the elephant in the room here. A lot of you might be thinking, as I show these slides, was that, was that a black widow that we just saw? And indeed, it was. Latrodectus is a genus within the family of cobweb spiders, Theridiidae, that is full of what we call medically significant spiders. They're not deadly spiders, but they're dangerous. Medically significant means a, uh, a bite from these creatures might result in a condition needing medical treatment or uh, medical advice of some sort because it could be bad. But Latrodectus is only one of the genera of cobweb spiders. I'm going to focus on two today. One of them is Latrodectus, the genus of spiders containing the widow spiders, and the other is Steatoda, the genus of spiders containing the false widow spiders. Now disclaimer, I don't mean to suggest that these are the only two genera of the family Theridiidae of the cobweb spiders. There are tons of them, and in fact, these two aren't even the genus, the genera that hold the most species, but they are by far the two that you will most likely come across in your homes or outside your homes. And they are also some of the largest, so that's why we're going to focus on these. I've seen many cobweb spiders in my days, and I can only think of one that didn't fall into one of these two genera, if that tells you how, uh, just how common these guys are. Let's start with the widow spiders, Latrodectus. Now, these are really cool. There are some of the very rare exceptions of spiders that can actually do some damage with their bite. Now, here we have a assorted four different images of different Latrodectus spiders. So, we're going to start at the top left with Latrodectus hesperus. That is the western black widow, and it is found right here where I live, in Denver, Colorado. It's a really, really gorgeous spider. They're very big cobweb spiders. Latrodectus, if I'm not mistaken, is the genus with the largest cobweb spiders in the world. And their silk is really strong, so much so that if you try and tear it apart, it'll crack as it breaks. It's super duper cool. Um, moving clockwise, over on the right side, we have Latrodectus stredicum guttatus, and that is going to be called the Mediterranean Widow. Uh, this guy is found in Europe like in the areas around Italy and other places around the Mediterranean Sea. Below that we have Latrodectus heseltai. This is the famous redback spider from Australia. Also a pretty dangerous bite from this girl. And over on the left we have Latrodectus geometricus. This is the brown widow. It looks a little bit different than its cousins, but if we turn it over it does still have a cool orange or red hourglass sign that the widows are famous for. Uh, Geometricus the Brown Widow is kind of all over the world at this point, in Asia, Africa, South America, Europe, North America, we have them all over the place. I believe it's common consensus as of right now that their place of origin was Africa, but they're basically everywhere. So because these spiders are a little bit more dangerous than the other spiders that we're going to talk about in this guide, I just want to take a brief moment to explain that these spiders really don't want anything to do with you. Just like other cobweb spiders, they will try to put their webs the farthest away from where there is traffic, human traffic, basically anyone walking by. They do not want you walking over their webs. They don't want you walking into their webs. They don't want to look at you. They don't want to think about you. They definitely don't want to bite you. So they put their webs in the places where they believe there will be less obstruction. And sometimes they miss. Uh, sometimes they don't expect that we were going to go near those places and that's where accidental bites can happen. But generally, these spiders don't want anything to do with any sort of trouble. And we know this because they are constantly trying to tell us. They have evolved different ways, different examples of warning coloration, for example, to really make it clear that we don't want any trouble. Don't come near me and I won't come near you. And uh, one of the clearest examples of these is in the traditional Black Widow view of the 
adult female El Hesperus up at the top left where she is completely glossy black except for this one red marking at the bottom of her abdomen. Most people agree that this is a type of warning coloration where it's basically a warning to potential predators that this animal is toxic and you don't want to go near it. And that way everyone gets saved the trouble. Not everything is in this genus is going to be just all black with that one red hourglass mark. In fact, even in the Western Black Widow El Hesperus, there are some sloppy hourglass marks that I've seen where you can barely even tell that it's there. In some cases, it's not even there, right? But in a lot of cases, it will be. And of course, with other species, the markings are going to be different. They still try and keep to their black and red coloration, with the exception of maybe the Brown Widow. That's one of the different ones, but it does still keep, try and keep the hourglass mark there. One last little thing I want to say about widow spiders is that the female adults are the ones that are mostly considered to be the dangerous ones. Uh, that's not to say you should get careless with sub-adult females or male black widows. I have uh, seen and housed a male black widow in here. Uh, I have held multiple cobweb spiders, but I didn't, I didn't handle the male black widow, despite what I'm saying about their venom being... Uh, knowingly less toxic because yeah, I don't know it's just not a risk I wanted to take uh, it's okay to respect all animals and some should be respected from a distance right so some of you may have heard this fact that was spread by a uh, news station CBS or NBC or something like that in an article that said that rat um, black widows are actually deadlier than rattlesnakes um, that they're almost 15 times more toxic I believe was the st statistic and the truth about that is actually, it is true, but it's also false. It's a little bit misleading. And that's the problem really when we talk about toxicity is that drop for drop, the black widow venom is stronger than a lot of venomous serpents, uh, the, the venom from those. However, the black widow is a much, much smaller animal, right? And a lot of times the quantity of venom that can be injected into something is a lot more important to determine the symptoms of that bite than exactly how toxic the venom was. Because yes, the Black Widow might be f uh, have 15 times stronger venom than a rattlesnake, but a rattlesnake is going to be able to inject 1,500 times the amount of venom with one bite than a Black Widow, right? So there have been very few Black Widow death cases that I've heard of, even with the Redback in Australia, which is often cited as the most toxic of the Latrodectus members. Uh, the deaths from these bites are really rare, and most likely you would just experience painful, uh, long-lasting, a couple of days uh, pain, sometimes localized in the lower back, sometimes localized more where the bite actually took place, but after a few days, you'll be totally fine. All right, that's enough about the widows. Let's talk about some of the more underappreciated members of the cobweb family. And that is the false widows. These are some of the animals I see the most of in my house, specifically the triangulate cobweb spider. It's called Steatoda triangulosa. You can actually see it on the bottom right of the screen. These animals are called false widow spiders because their body shape resembles the widows so much, and they're actually one of the larger cobweb spiders, so people can get confused. Now, uh, they are not as large as the Latrodactus, the true widows. They're going to be small. Most of them can fit within one of my fingernails. And their venom is a lot less toxic. It is speculated that because they hold some of the similar latrotoxins to their cousins, that their venom is a little bit stronger than the average spider. However, their venom is not strong enough to be considered medically significant by experts. And like I said, I have handled some of these guys in the past. Um, couldn't tell you the strength of the venom because they didn't release a bite, because most spiders do not want to bite you. They don't want to waste their precious venom on something that they're not going to eat. So, Let's look at the body plans once again. The abdomen, really big and round. The cephalothorax, a lot smaller, right? When they are in webs, they're kind of hanging upside down in that classic cobweb spider position. And the legs, long and skinny, but the two longest ones are the two in the front and the two in the back. These guys, uh, Statota grossa and Statota nobilis on the left side, they are European. However, Statota grossa has spread all over the United States. It is actually a really good... Um, a really good spider when it comes to being an invasive species and it's thought that it's just really good at reproducing laying those egg sacs so it's spread wildly just like its cousin the brown widow right 
Parasteatoda tepidariorum technically is a different genus, but Parasteatoda and Steatoda, uh, as you can tell by the names, are very closely related. That one has been called the common house spider, and it's very common over in Europe. We have a few of them here in the United States as well. And Steatoda triangulosa, here at the bottom right, is my personal favorite because it's my housemates. They're all over my house. And these spiders, uh, all of the cobweb spiders, really, are really good pest control. And they're really common. They're really common indoors. They're commonly found in houses. There was a study, I believe, that was released that said that these are the, the cobweb spiders are the most common type of animal that are found in people's houses, period. <laughs> I think it was a small study, but it was pretty telling. And I can confirm there are a lot of cobweb spiders in the spring, fall, and summer around my house. Uh, lastly, I want to bring up some cobweb spiders that you may never see, but they're still really interesting because even though the the most important ones to learn are the common ones that we're going to be seeing every day, the Latrodectus and the Steatoda, I think it's important to explore just how large this family of spiders really is because there's a lot of variety that we don't get to appreciate just by studying the spiders that we see. And one of them is this fella over here on the left. She's called Enoplognatha ovata and is commonly referred to as the candy stripe spider. You might be able to see why. This is a uh, type of cobweb spider that has actually specialized at existing around flowering plants, and it's kind of turned into an ambush predator for pollinator insects that kind of want to fly around. They get tangled up in this web that suddenly in between the leaves, and they get consumed. Definitely not one of the spiders I'd expect to find in someone's home, particularly because they're adapted to, well, um, building their webs on flowers, right? But it is a really cool find. I've seen one of these spiders, if not this species, a relative of its, just once, and it was a really, really cool find. Over on the right, we have Anelosimus eximius, and this is a spider that's been widely studied because it's eusocial. It's a social spider, um, kind of like the way ants and termites all live together in a hive, this is one of the very few examples where spiders don't just go off on their own. They kind of live in these communities. Uh, looking at it at first glance, you might think that this is a picture of a uh, a lot of baby spiders before they disperse and leave the nest, right? Because that's usually the only time that we find spiders all huddled together like this. But no, these cobweb spiders really do live together, and sometimes they spin communal webs that stretch out really far distances. It's a really interesting animal. Uh, the very last thing that I want to touch up on is because these spiders are so frequently found in people's homes, that a lot, something else that will be frequently found in people's homes are egg sacs of these spiders. You'll find them directly on webs, uh, usually a little bit further back toward the wall so that the egg is protected and not in harm's way. They look like small little white balls. Uh, multiple egg sacs can be laid by one spider, so some webs will have one egg sac, some of them will have up to five. And uh, I honestly think these are low cause for concern. Of course, if they belong to a Latrodectus um, medically significant widow species, maybe a little bit more concerning. But generally, what happens when these eggs hatch is that the little spiders come out, they disperse, right? They, you don't want to be with other spiders because you might be prey <laughs> to that spider. So they'll disperse, and usually a lot of them will die of starvation, a lot of them will fail to find food, a lot of them will get eaten themselves, and a very small percentage of them will actually make it all the way up to adulthood. Uh, some of these spiders will do what is called ballooning, where they just release a strand of silk, but keep it attached to them, and just release it longer and longer, and then let the wind carry them off, and they basically fly. However, if they're in your house, probably not going to happen until they find their way outside. So basically, if you don't want these egg sacs in there, even though I do not believe they're going to cause a problem, and I did specify that I think these spiders are fantastic pest control, you can scoop it up with either a cup or a broom, just like go in there and do a little circle with a broom, or go in from the bottom of the web and uh, with a cup, and then just move the cup upward to capture everything in it, and then just take them outside and put them somewhere where you might forget about them. All right, to recap, cobweb spiders are really cool spiders. They build awesome and really strong webs. They're very efficient predators. There's a ton of cobweb spiders, and they're actually some of the most commonly found spiders in people's homes. You can tell something is a cobweb spider usually because it has a small cephalothorax and a big abdomen. That's small first part with the eyes and the mouth and big last part with all, all of the guts and the spinnerets. Uh, they have long and skinny legs. They build messy, messy webs. They're often found in basements or garages because they're out of the way. They don't want to build their webs in places with a lot of traffic. Some of them are dangerous. They'll try usually try to warn you with their red markings. 
Uh, but of course, remember that no spider is evil. No, none of them want to bite you. They all would rather uh, you stay away from them and they stay away from you. Cobweb spiders are fantastic pest control. So if you don't mind them in your garages or basements or near your doors, they will pick up a lot of just insect trash that kind of wanders its way into your house. Uh, finally, if you do not want these cobweb spiders in your house, but you don't want to kill them, you can try removing them with a cup or a broom. Anyway, guys, uh, thank you so much for listening. And this is going to wrap up our third episode regarding the cobweb spider. I hope you stick with us as we continue to release more episodes of our guide to spider identification. It's been a blast. Take care and I'll see you next time.